Um, so, uh, as Marco already said, I'm going to talk today about the notorious neurophilosophy of pain and the family resemblance approach to idiosyncrasy and generalizability. And what I'm presenting is roughly based um, on a paper that was published last year in Mind and Language with the exact same title. And I worked on that for a very long time. And then after that, how it usually is, it was published last year. I was like, okay, now I'm going to work on something else. And now I'm slowly coming back to it. So it's a really nice opportunity to get myself familiar with my own work again, and also to think like where are certain ways to elaborate on that and to keep on keep on going because there's definitely still open questions. So to a certain degree, all of that is still for me a work in progress, although it's already published. I guess that's how it's quite often is, right? Uh, and if you'd like to reach out, as already said, by mail, my homepage or Twitter, um, I'm always happy also if you have questions later on for which we don't have time today, maybe. So to give you a bit of an outline, I will start saying a bit about the neurophilosophy of pain and why it's notorious. Then I will say a few words about the neuroscience of pain. Um, I will then come to the position of scientific pain elementivism as defended by Jennifer Corns as a reaction to what one could say what I present in section one and two. And then I will try to show uh, how there could be an alternative that solves of some of the problems that scientific pain elementivism has. And finally, I will conclude my thoughts and try to show some implications and challenges and from there on then uh, start into the comments and the discussion. So maybe starting with like the neurophilosophy of pain and a bit of an introduction asking what is pain, why does it matter for neurophilosophy and why is neuroscience at all so to say of interest for pain research. Always when you're asked like, what is X? It's always good to look what wise people has already said before. And in the philosophy of pain, people normally start with Kripke, who said that pain is not picked out by one of its accidental properties. Rather, it's picked out by the property of being pain itself, by its immediate phenomenological quality. And if any phenomenon is picked out in exactly the same way that we pick out pain, then that phenomenon is pain. So here, pain is defined and um, identified by its phenomenal quali um, quality, by its phenomenal char character. And I think that, with a few exceptions, this is quite commonly accepted in pain, at least in this broader idea that we identify pains in terms of what they typically feel like. Um, and this has been, for instance, been said by Colin Klein last year in a paper where he said, if there's anything that's typical of all pain, I say, it, is that they feel like pains. This is how you identify them. So we can maybe say as the broad characterization to start with is when people talk about pain and philosophy, they normally say that pain is identified by what it's typically like for us to undergo such experience from a first person perspective. And in fact, pain is often used as the paradigmatic example of a subjective experience with a particular type of phenomenal character. So even if people are not engaging in a philosophy of pain, they often use pain as an example for experience that feel a certain way, or at least typically. Now, one could say that this is the starting point, but it's just, so to say, the starting point of the actual inquiry that has to be done, because we are not just interested in what pain is, but we are actually searching for a theory that accounts for the circumstances under which pain occurs. So we want to know why does a person feel pain and not, for example, itch, hunger or something else. Or we want to know why do these different pains feel like pains or why do we have a certain kind of subjective character to them. And what seems to be a deeply rooted conviction in philosophy and science is like, if we want to know something about pain, we need to find a certain type of property that we can characterize as current instinct. So we want to find something that's common to all pains and at the same time to pains only besides them being experienced as pain. So we're searching, so we define pain as a certain type of phenomenon and we want to find a certain type of property that has a one on one correspondence to it. And in principle, we could look at different um, properties. And this is, so to say, what I've mostly done in my work to consider different kinds of properties that might come into consideration. Uh, so we can look at causal roles. So what is the relation between pain and certain causes or effects? We could look at biological function, but all we're gonna hear today is that we're gonna look at neurocorrelates. And the attempted identification of a neurocorrelate of pain plays a paradigmatic role in the general debate about how subjective experience could arise from matter. That's why pain is all over the place when we often taught this look into philosophy, though it has rarely come into close focus. Um, but I would also like to highlight that this is not only of interest for philosophy, but the neurocorrelates of pain have been come more and more into focus because um, chronic pain, especially so pains that persist or reoccur after a time of like three to six months, are one of the most disabling medical conditions globally. And as such, it's of much interest to find better ways for their treatment. 
and looking at neurocorrelates have been, so to say, one attempt to do it. So there's a certain interest, not just from philosopher, but from clinical practitioners and also, so to say, from socioeconomic perspectives. Now, when we typically look, so to say, in the history of philosophy and where pain popped up as a paradigmatic example, we often find it in the debates around type identity. So, for instance, in the work of Smart, he says that sensations are nothing over and above brain process and a certain type of sensation can be identified with a certain type of brain process, including pain. Typically, um, an objection to that is multiple realizability. So Putnam, for instance, has said that given the variety of terrestrial beings capable of experiencing pain, such a phenomena cannot be identified with a single type of brain process. So if all different species of animals experience pain, their brains are different. So we cannot say there's a certain type of brain process associated with um, the general uh, phenomenal type of pain. The thing is that in the debate, many people sidestep this debate by saying we are just interested into human pain and we're going to make this tricky as well. So I'm not going to talk about animals, also as we do, it's just about humans. And this is also what we see mostly in research. So people have been looking for biomarkers of human pain and biomarkers in general are measurable biological parameters that may function as reliable indicators for something. In this case, we are interested in pain. And this could, in the first place, be any kind of biological processes or factors we are interested in. But what is particularly interesting, if we follow this idea that I've outlined in the beginning, which seems to be like this deep rooted conviction um, in philosophy and, and also in the neurosciences, that we want to find an ideal biomarker, so a measurable biological parameter that may function as a current and distinct indicator for pain. And the identification of such either biomarker would, of course, spoke for the existence of a biological process that has a one-on-one -on -one correspondence to human pain, so to human pain at least. The question is then, is there an either biomarker of this kind? What should be noted is that for a while, when we look into the, the history of pain size, a lot of focus has been on the peripheral system, so the non-brain body. Um, people have been looking especially at nociceptors, so there's certain kind of receptors associated with actual potential tissue damage. And people have been searching for pain receptors or pain fibers and so on. But it has been turned out that there's no linear correspondence between pain and nociceptive uh, sickness from the periphery. So there can be, so to say, very basically said, there can be tissue damage without pain, there can be pain without tissue damage, and pain and tissue damage in their intensity and severity as well as in their qualities do not have a linear relation to each other. And to a certain degree, this has, so to say, shifted the focus. It's like, if we're going to find any ideal biomarker, this is going to be something in the brain. And therefore, people have looked for neuromarkers, so measurable parameters of neuroprocess in the brain in contrast to other non-brain-based biomarkers. So this, of course, then in a second step, brings us to the question, is there an ideal neuromarker for pain? A few words about the motivation here again, because I, I, um, I think this is quite important and it uh, should like, so to say, um, help to sidestep any kind of objections concerning that this is just a straw man argument. If you look, for example, at the work of Roy and Varga, Moretti and Annette, they have really tried to show that there is a very strong motivation in the neuroscience of pain to find something like that has a one on one correspondence to pain. Quite often, it seems that they're so promising to find this for pain, right? Pain is such a fundamental part of our everyday life. It seems at first glance to be such a simple experience. If we ever find so to say, a neurocorrelate with a one-on-one -on -one correspondence for anything, then it should be pain, right? And at the same time, finding this kind of thing would be of so much use. So it would be so useful to have it for explanation, prediction, treatment, right? So if we would find that, then we could just look at neuroimaging data and say, this person is experiencing pain instead of itch, for example, especially when we have, for instance, patients who cannot report their pain. Or we could say, oh, we find a certain kind of neural, uh, neural parameter, then we can intervene on it. And if this is the thing that underlies all our pain experience, then we could, these interventions, pharmacological, surgical, or extra-physiological, they could be a factor for a variety of different pain cases. So this could actually help to treat a multiplicity, for example, of chronic pain patients. So there is like for different reasons, a quite strong motivation to find these kind of things to say, oh, here's pain. And now we find this kind of neurocorrelate that's distinct for pain that helps us to distinguish pain from other phenomena. And that we can use, for example, to make predictions about effectivity of treatment or whether, uh, or other kinds of things to apply to many different pain cases. This of course brings us then to the question of like, this is only nice, not only nice to have, but is it really there? 
Um, and I think what can be said clearly um, is that there's no single brain region that's involved in pain. Um, so there's nothing like a pain cortex whose activity is sufficient for pain to emerge. And this is what we already find in the wall and the work of Waltzek and Moore, for example, who are like the pain uh, pioneers. And I think that in general, this is not too surprising, given that we know right now that neural processes related to various mental phenomena appear too complex to for such um, strict correspondence. There's so much neural reuse um, involved in the brain that it's not too surprising, so to say, I think that there is no pain cortex in the brain that has this nice functional relation. Instead, what we see is that pain is processed in a widely distributed network uh, composed of multiple simultaneously active brain sites, and especially um, in the lab of Apkurian, um, they have done also a lot of studies on that, also on meta-analysis. And what you see here, for example, is an illustration of all the different brain areas that are typically involved in brain processing, giving a meta-analysis of the different neuroimaging data. So you can see big parts of your brain are actually involved when you're experiencing pain. Now, for a while, this has uh, one could say sparked some excitement and some researchers have said, I oh, now this network, which is often called neuromatrix in reference to MELSAC, this could actually be the cerebral counterpart of pain. So we don't have a pain cortex, but maybe we have a pain matrix. And this is what is also has been labeled for a while. But especially, for example, in the work of Inetti Moreau, um, but also in, in um, Legrand, have tried to show that the activity of this entire set of neural structures is still not exclusive for pain. It's also involved in itches and dyspnea and non pain related terminal and tactical cessation. Some studies also indicate it's involved in nausea. You could say maybe it's something like a body matrix, how Melzack called it, but it's not a pain matrix, especially as it has been shown um, by Tim Solomons, for example, that this network can even be active in patients who are unable to experience pain. So, to a certain degree, the issue of coupling pain to a particular neural process just shifts to a different level. So, from a pain region uh, from a, to a pain network, which can't, we cannot find. Somehow, in response to that, what we find more and more is that uh, researchers don't focus so much on the macroscopic um, entire network, but on the nerve impulses that, uh, or the, so to say, the activity patterns that dynamically flow through the neural matrix. You can think about it in this way. Think of an orchestra, which has certain kind of members, and this orchestra can be involved in playing different kind of melodies. Just looking at the members of the orchestra will not tell you what melody they play, but if you see how they interact, how exactly their, their activity relates to each other, maybe also how they coordinate their activity, this gives you an idea of like which melody they are playing, and this is, so to say, different, uh, so they can play different melodies. You might think about this, the neural matrix, that's the orchestra. It might bring about different kind of neurosignatures depending on the weighted activity in different brain areas and how they relate to each other, how, so to say, the activity is coordinated across this network. And this is where people had looked at neurosignatures. This is, so to say, what they indicate these kind of neural activity patterns. And first studies, especially labs in the Tovaga lab, have shown that neurosignatures of some pains differ from the neurosignatures of some non pain phenomena. And this, of course, raises the question, is there a pain signature? So maybe we don't find a pain cortex, maybe we don't find a pain matrix, but maybe we can have a pain signature. The thing is that the existence of certain neurosignatures that can be used to predict pain does, in contrast to non-pains does not imply that there's a pain signature because it has to do more. It has to also apply to all different kinds of pain, at least if we want to use the term pain signature in this manner. But the point is that the patterns of nerves and pulses differ across different kinds of pain. And this has to do with three different factors where we could say like these are categories of factors that come into play. The first is the medical condition. So most experiments that we see are conducted on cutaneous pain. So they are, have to do or, or somatic pains, everything that has to do with your skin, with your bones, with your joints, with your ligaments, with your muscles. This often has a factor because they are easy to elicit and they don't cause damage to the patient. So for example, they put a patch um, uh, on your arm, they regulate a certain heat up and to a certain moment you experience pain. This is for instance, how they elicit this in an experimental setting. And it seems to be, for example, that if this is thermally induced in this manner or mechanically induced or by electrophysiological stimulations, there seems to be a very similar neurosignature. It seems to indicate, oh, right, we, we might be on a good way to find this kind of pain signature. 
The thing is, we know that there are differences in the neural processing, for instance, of visceral pain. So everything that has to do with your inner organs, which is quite rarely tested because it's very difficult to elicit these kinds of experiences, though possible. And also there are differences to neuropathic pain. So pains that have to do with the peripheral, uh, with your nervous system, such as phantom pains or fibrilgia, allodynia, um, or migraine, for example. To a certain degree, if I understood the empirical debate correctly, it's not clear whether we are able to find a neurosignature or to adjust our parameters in such a way that we can make, uh, that we find a neurosignature that applies to all of these different kinds of cases. At least we have reasons to be skeptical that is the case. I think a clearer case is when it comes to temporal scope. So what happens when people are suffering from pain for a longer moment, uh, for a longer time span? And what we know is that people who are suffering from chronic pain undergo certain kind of neural reorganization. So there, we often find a loss of neural density, of neural connectivity, a change uh, in the neurochemistry as well. And we see that experimentally induced pain in acute, so I'd say in healthy subjects and in chronic pain patients leads to different neurosignatures. So especially there, even people like Abkurin, who have been very optimistic of finding a pain signature for acute pains, say that we will most likely not find one for acute pains as well as chronic pains. And on top of that, so to say, we know that there are individual differences which have to do with different subpopulations which the individual is part of. This could be personality traits, whether two people are neurotypical, or atypical, whether they're comorbidities, for us, whether the people are also suffering from depression, for example. Genetics are also like sex might play a role, age, sociocultural factors, and so on. So there could also be difference in this neurosignature, leading some research to say that every person has um, their own pain signature. So if we summarize these, um, what I've just presented, then scientists have not been able to identify a brain-based parameter that allows us to make statements about pain in a current and distinct manner. And so to say this, Parameter neither exists when we look at brain regions or neural networks, and also not when we look at those neural um, signatures. This has to do with two things. On the one hand, this broader neural matrix, this is not exclusively associated with pain. So here's the problem's multifunctionality. On the other hand, pain is associated with multiple patterns of neural activity when we sort of say zoom in. So here the issue of multiple uh, realizability or to generally say comes to the fore. And given these both things together, we just don't find something that's, so to say, distinct for pain and current at the same time. And given the current state of knowledge, we find ourselves in this manner, confronted with a quite real possibility that pain might be without neural correspondence at the type level. As a side note, there are some people who are a bit more optimistic than me about this. So say, I mean, but maybe we, we might still find this, right? So um, I, I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know, maybe we are. Um, I just think what we can state right now, we don't have it. I think based on what we know so far, we have reasons to be pessimistic. And even if we find in the future, it might be just interesting to think through what happens if we don't find it, because this might be the case for other phenomena as well. So even if you don't believe I'm right about that, it might still be of interest uh, to what I have to say uh, from here on. So now the question is, if you buy this, so you follow me on that, so what is the consequence that follows from that? And I think so far in the literature, one of the rare persons who have really thought this through, like what happens if this is the case, is Jennifer Collins. And she really much inspired my work. And uh, she has defended a position called scientific pain relativism, which might be summarized by the question of why don't we just stop talking about pain and science? So to give you, uh, I think many of you will be familiar with it, but just like as a broad definition of what scientific eliminativism is about, the idea is that certain classificatory concepts that we use in science are useful only if they successfully refer to the same thing in each case where the concept is applied. So in certain entities, certain process, a certain event, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that only then this enables such thing to become the subject of scientific use or generalization. So the thing that the classifier concept successfully refers to guarantees the usefulness of our scientific generalizations. So water is our classifier concepts. It always refers in scientific contents to H2O. I mean, it's a toy example here. H2O is a certain chemical composition in the world. We always refer to this in all our, um, um, every time we use the concept. And it's this chemical composition that guarantees the usefulness of our generalizations, such as 
water always solves salt as one example. Now, so to say, the consequence of scientific elementivism is that if this is not the case, so if our classificatory concepts are not, uh, do not successfully refer in, uh, to the same thing in the world in each case where the concept is applied, then the respective concepts should be eliminated and replaced by a set of concepts satisfying the previous condition. So, for example, Griffith said we should get rid of our emotional concepts such as fear because, in fact, they refer to two different kinds of things, very uh, fast um, effect programs and, so to say, higher cognitive emotions. We can make no useful um, generalizations about fear because these two different things have different properties and they also come along with different neural processes. So we should not talk about fear, but maybe about like fear one understood as a fact program and fear two understood as a high cognitive emotion. So typically the consequence of scientific eliminativism is subtyping. And what might be important to note is that the scientific abandonment of concepts does not narrowly con, um, concern the use of the corresponding folk concept. So that's scientific limitivism in contrast to traditional limitivism, which might also um, affect the use of certain concepts in our everyday life, which this seem to be two different kinds of things. This is an idea that especially Eduard Mashri has um, uh, brought forward, and it's also, um, uh, it's also taken over by Jennifer Corns. So what Jennifer Kuhns then says is that the classificatory concept of pain should be eliminated from science because it does not successfully refer to the same thing in each case where the concept is applied. As we have seen, there is no valid biomarker. So Kuhns applies this, so she looks at the brain, but also at non-brain biological process, and I fully agree with that. We have no biomarker, no ideal biomarker whatsoever. So the brain has already been our best shot. Um, and she says also, like, there's no current indistinct reference object for the classificator concepts of pain that could function as a reliable target for generalizations and explanation, prediction, and treatment, and therefore we should get rid of pain, of our classificator concept of pain in science. Now, to a certain degree, this means we don't find what we might call our research idol here. So what we want it to have, right? We don't find this type of phenomenal thing that we can relate in a one-on-one -on -one correspondence to a certain type of neural process. So we cannot type or talk about pain, or we should not talk about pain following the idea of scientific eliminativism because we can make no useful generalizations about it. Now, what about the subtyping? I think the subtyping is actually of no use because if we take scientific eliminativism's idea really seriously, we will always, so to say, run into the same problem over and over again. So think about we get rid of pain. Instead, we want to talk about somatic pain, visceral pain, and, and uh, neuropathic pain, for example. Now, with visceral pain, we could say, yeah, but there's a difference between acute and chronic visceral pain. So, okay, further subtyping. We can talk about chronic visceral pain, but then we might have to talk about people with a comorbidity of depression and those without further subtyping. And then we say, like, yeah, but it's not the exact same neurosignature, right? When we talk about female atypical depressive people of a higher age in contrast to other kind of subpopulations, for example. So we might get into that, of course, we become better and better in the sense of like our predictions about the groups we generalize about becomes like more and more um, um, more and more useful in this sense. But to a certain degree, we could always say like, oh, we could further subtypes. Then we are even better because these neurosignatures are even more similar to each other, right? And if we then take scientific pain elementivism seriously, we can also not make generalizations about these because they don't refer to the exact same thing in each case. And to a certain degree, if, if the researchers are right and every person has their own neurosignature and there's difference between the medical conditions and the time spans, then we will just be there with pain tokens. So this means every single pain case must will reveal a signature of neural activity different from any other pain case, including difference of particular conditions, particular points in time and particular individuals. So every single pain episode, so to say, is like a snowflake with their own neural uh, signature. And this is also something, so Korn's also agrees, in the end we, we end up with pain tokens. So she says every single pain case is idiosyncratic. And I, I agree with her, and I agree also that we should re reject an oversimplified picture of pain and accept the uniqueness of every single pain case. But acknowledging variation can also especially help us to promote the development of more efficient person-centered and context-sensitive intervention, which is a very important aspect um, also in my work to emphasize the uniqueness of pain cases, especially when it comes to different individuals. 
But, and this, that's a big one, it's even way too small on this, on this slide here. The central pain, aim of pain research is generalizability. When we just have tokens, we might run into really serious problems because the insight gains concerning pain tokens are by themselves of minor scientific utility. Such insights are particularly useful when combined, related or compared, enabling researchers to generalize across test condition samples and participants. So we want some kind of knowledge transfer. So even when we have like personalized therapies, we need to rely in some sense on our previous experiences with other pain cases. And this should be evidence-based. So this should not just be like on pure intuition. And if we want to do this, then we might must find a way to handle the idiosyncrasy of the pain cases and still somehow ally for generalizability. So what I think that pain scientific elementalism does well is to adequately highlight the variation across and uniqueness of pain cases. And even in the absence of an ideal biomarker, we need, however, an approach that allows for scientific generalizations. And I would like to mention that Corns, to a certain degree, uh, is aware of that, and she makes a suggestion of how to circumnavigate this and by saying we don't look at the, for example, the neural mechanisms underlying pain itself, but those that are involved in bringing about the unique neurosignatures or neural activity patterns of pain. Um, I'm happy to talk about more in the q and I. I just think that we've run into the same problem again because these kinds of that it's maybe difficult to identify here types of mechanisms, especially when we again want to talk about brain processes, for example. So instead of that, um, I suggest that we should fully embrace the idiosyncrasy of biological processes associated with pain. So everything we might get is tokens. And in accepting that, we can start to ask ourselves, how do we now handle this problem in the next step? And this is, so to say, where my own theory comes in addressing exactly this kind of question. So how can we manage the trade-off between idiosyncrasy and generalizability? So the idea I'm presenting is very roughly inspired by Wittgenstein. That's why it's called family resemblance theory. And as you might know, Wittgenstein assumed that in the absence of necessary and sufficient condition, the meaning of certain concepts is constituted by a complex network of similarities holding between the members of the respective family, which are in this case the instances in which we use the respective context. And Wittgenstein was interested in semantic rules of like everyday use of certain concepts. So he's interested in how we use folk concepts. This is not what I'm interested in. That's why there's also a substantial difference in that. And I'm particularly interested um, in the, so to say here, in the neurophysiological rules that exist and that um, uh, describe similarities between different kinds of pains with respect to the neural activity patterns. Um, to say that, so to say the starting point is that we assume that pain is a family of experiences of a particular phenomenotype. So this is really just like the starting condition that we had at the beginning. So pains, we identify them by subjective experience. That's so to say how we say they are members of that. And the pain tokens constitute uh, that are part of this family. So every single pain token is one member of this family of pain. And they differ in terms of the neural implementation. Every single pain token has their own neurosignature. We just accept that for the time being. So and in the present, in the absence of an Ida neural marker, the family members can, however, be characterized along the complex structure of resemblance relations holding between the idiosyncratic neural activities. So we can look at how similar are these different pain tokens to each other. So this is really just a toy example, X and Y dimension. Just think of any kind of aspect concerning the neural activity patterns of pain that we might compare uh, the different pains to. Of course, this is going to be way, way more complex when we actually put this in um, into practice, just think like here are the pain cases, they are yellow, this is the things that feel like pain, and then we have a few others, let's say these are a few each cases. And now the resemblance relation, or we just put them here in the place, it just captures how similar pains are across different contexts, samples, participants, with respect to the neural activity. That's the first step of the idea. Now we can make different generalizations, which might be more or less uh, which include more or less um, members of the pain family. So we can make generalizations concerning different more or less fine-grained areas of this complex structure of similarities holding between individual pain cases and their corresponding uh, neural activity patterns. 
So we may group pine cases together in different, more or less fine grained manner and gloss over the difference between the members of this particular group. So we make generalizations that apply to all of them, but so to say, then ignore different uh, certain kind of differences between them. This might concern our different podcasting groups. So we might just refer to a single person experiencing the same thing at the same pine for certain days. We might look at for example, LM terminal uh, cutaneous pains, and we might look at chronic pains, which might be partly overlapping, or we might look at all visceral pains in neuro to up, uh, atypical female. So you might, might, so to say, collect these kinds of group, however you are, and of course, it's interesting how they cluster together. So again, this is really just a toy example, but the important thing is also how we group them together. It doesn't have to be mutual exclusive. We can have overlapping different kinds of groupings. Now, the interesting point is that, of course, for example, Quants might say, yeah, yeah, we can, we can cluster them, we can like group them, we can gloss over the differences, but the respective generalizations are not going to be useful. And I would say that they can be useful uh, when the similarities are strong enough with respect to our a certain scientific purpose. So it really depends on what, what we want to do with the generalizations um, um, that, that we generate by, uh, so just like glossing over the difference of a certain group or family members. And of course, the generalizations suggested here, they cannot be applied in the same unquestioned manner as would have been the case if we had discovered an ideal biomarker. That would be awesome, right? That gives us all these different kinds of things. But as we don't have that, our generalization is going to be limited. I don't think this is ne necessarily negative. It can also be very useful to know the limitations of our generalizations for different contexts. But the thing is, we can ne not nonetheless, and this is, let's say, the main point, make useful generalizations. And the limitations that always come with this is that generalizations applying to more family members unnecessarily ignore aspects of their variation and might fail to distinguish pay from non pines and generalizations that refer to fewer members of the pain family are more restricted in the scope of their applicability and predictive power. So that's, so to say, the pragmatic trade-off that we always have. Now, this idea is not entirely new, so it's not that I fully invented that myself, but I definitely want to get credit for to the people from which uh, I, to a certain degree, have been inspired in developing this idea. So the first direction is definitely contextualism. You might like Dan Bernstein or Colin Klein have developed the idea of neural contextualism so that neural activity has always been, uh, must be considered in the context of other neural activity in which it's, so it's, which is connected, in which it's taking place. Um, I think this is already part of the inherent idea of uh, pain signature, but this really includes how brain activity and different areas relates to each other. But I think that you could go even further and for instance, um, say that generalizations over neural data also require context in the sense that this context depends on our specific research interests. So which are the subpopulations that we consider as the most useful reference class? Which are the kinds of methods we want to use to, um, to, to generate our data, to interpret our data? What do we want to do with this data? Do we want to, to use this data for treatment or do we want to use this data um, as a heuristic for further research, all of this is going to make a big difference in terms of whether a certain generalization can be considered useful or not. And I think this idea is also already to be found in the work of Boyd and Khalidi, for example, when they saying, as this especially refers to Boyd, that we accommodate our scientific practice to causal structures that provide the supporting ground for successful generalizations. So these are the structures in the world that we find, such as, for example, these structures of similarities. But whether our specific generalizations are appropriately related, appropriately related to these causal structures, this depends on the respective scientific context. So what I'm rejecting to a certain degree is the general background assumption that pi must either be identical to a biological process in one-on-one -on -one correspondence or abandoned as a useful target for generalizations in science altogether. Um, again, I follow here Boyd fully in the idea that the risk quest for exceptionalism and universal generalizations is in general way too demanding, especially when we refer to something as, as pain in neuroscience, and that the notion of scientific usefulness might allow for way more variability. I also think that to a certain degree, at least in some neuroscientific research, the ideas that I've presented here are to a certain degree also reflected. 
So for example, quite often we see, for instance, Ryan Varga pointed this out that um, research that what they do is that to quantify about the similarities between neural processes. So they even talk about the resemblance relations between different neurosignatures, accepting that they're going to be quite idiosyncratic. What we also often find is that nearest markers uh, are used to provide best guesses. So to say certain kind of cases are similar enough, and now we make a best guess concerning a certain outcome. For example, given this neuroimaging data we already have, now we have a new one. This is quite similar to these we already have. So the best guess is this person is going to be experiencing pain instead of itch, for example. Or to say this, we already have these kind of data. Now this person is quite, or these neuroimaging data are quite similar to that. So most likely this kind of treatment is going to be effective here. And this of course works just on best guesses. So how strong the similarities are, the better our predictions might be, for instance. Um, but this might also depend on the context. So what do we, what kind of predictions do we want to meet? What are we guessing about, for example? And I think this is quite an interesting point that philosophers often talk about, we want to find something on a one-on-one -on -one correspondence. So that's oh, distinct. So this allows us to distinguish pain from non-pains and at the same time to apply to all pains. But we quite often see that what neuromarkers are supposed to do is not to be highly sensitive to all pains and at the same time, perfectly selective because mostly they, they use sometimes different neuromarkers for these two different purposes. So even though we can make useful generalizations, maybe that are rather fulfilling one of the criteria for the trade off of not being so useful for the other thing. Now, I really would like to highlight that Korns is also uh, aware that in principle, it must might be possible to make useful generalizations about something, even if there's no thing in the world that we always refer to um, with respective concepts. And she calls this a liberal criterion of scientific utility. So she says, okay, there's, there's no valid biomarker for pain. Normally in scientific limitivism, we should now say, oh, we can make no useful generalizations. But she says, yeah, but maybe if we allow form a liberal criterion, maybe we might, it might be possible to make reference to pain or its subtypes in useful generalizations, even if we don't find an IL biomarker for them. But then she says, but this is not the case. She says, not in any scientific context. And I think that this is not quite true. So Korn's primarily refers to treatment and then later on we'll make a few notes on treatment um, where she has good reason to at least say, okay, we can make no general treatment uh, decisions based on just talking about pain. I fully agree with that. But I think we should be aware that there are different scientific contexts, which we might do, and that even in treatment, we always go beyond pain tokens. And I would like to present a few examples for that. Again, really toy examples. So first of all, we might, for example, generalize across the instances of a headache that a single patient experiences during a week, ignoring difference between the cases of curing at different moments within this time span. So a single person, a single condition, but just like a few instances um, within a certain time span. And it might be that here now, if we want to treat this, we have to take into account difference between medical conditions and intra-individual differences. This is all what we have to consider. And also we shouldn't expect that, for example, um, 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 a certain kind of drug, let's say pharmacological intervention that's useful for the patient at moment T1 is then also still useful like two years later. It can still be that there's intra-individual differences. But for example, the effects of chronification are relatively slow. So if we know that this medication has been useful for the patient for two weeks now, we don't start giving the person another medication, but we make the very well-informed guess that this medication is going to be useful for the patient also in the next day. And this is already a certain way in which we generalize across tokens by making, saying here, this is going to be quite similar, the kind of neural process that are involved. And if we have a certain kind of pharmacological intervention that intervenes on the respective neuroparameter, that we expect this to also be effective on the next day. Here, the similarities are at least strong enough. But of course, this might not apply to other pain uh, conditions. It might not apply to other subjects, for example. We could also, for instance, talk about different um, medi uh, so single medical condition, but experienced by, for instance, different individuals. And for instance, neural signatures associated with certain conditions, at least, can also be used to predict the occurrence of pain with respect to out of sample individuals based on previously conducted data. So in some cases, we're quite good doing that. Um, and this seems to have to do with the fact that 
uh, there is a certain neural anatomically similarities between different humans where we can use this and where we can also say, okay, when we now look um, at the neural data of cognitively impaired adults or minimal conscious patients, like locked in patients, maybe we can then use this to make informed guess whether they are experiencing pain, for example, or not. The thing is, we should, of course, this has limitations. We should be aware that there might be a difference between healthy uh, adults on which normally our data are collected and, for example, people with poor morbidities. Um, and that we should, of course, sometimes think about that we reduce the subpopulations that we generalize about to have a stronger uh, predictive power. And in some cases, we should like, so to say, make this broader for, for other kinds of purposes. As for instance, an idea that um, I took over from the work of Marco <laughs> to think about the different reference groups. So as a third example, we might generalize, for example, across individuals in order to identify people who are at risk of developing chronic pain. Also maybe different kinds of forms of chronic pain. And this might be very helpful to identify the general need for preventive measure, measures across different subtypes of chronic pain, or so across different kinds of um, individuals. Here, the limitation is clearly going to be that such predictions are not perfectly selective with respect to pain. So people are at risk of developing chronic pain might also be at risk of developing chronic itch, for example. But this is not necessarily a negative thing. Is is our use here is really to identify people who need certain kind of preventive measures that maybe are not just helpful for chronic pain, but most likely also because of chronic itch, as they when they have certain kind of similarities, then this could actually be quite helpful. And finally, we might even go really broad and like different pain conditions, temporal, different temporal scales, different individuals. I mean, we're just going to make like very broad statements, like for example, anatomical structures X, Y, Z are typically involved in pain processing and things like that. What we come up with clear limited might not be specific for pain, at least borderline cases of other phenomena is going to be included if we make certain kind of um, uh, predictions that are very, very broad. Um, might definitely, uh, as I said, not specific, but what this might help us to better understand the relation between different uh, pain and certain other phenomena, such as, for instance, sleep disruption. If we here include anatomical structures that are reused, for example, uh, in sleep regulation, this might also be helpful. I mean, especially when we talk, for instance, on evolution, that, that's something that Colin Klein brought up. When we, for instance, interest in the evolution of the uh, neural uh, mechanisms or neural process associated with pain, especially then these kind of inter-individual differences might not just be relevant. I mean, to a certain degree, we might also then better understand maybe how the itch system evolved because they seem to be very closely linked, but still this could be interesting. And also just think about this as a heuristic that might foster a further discovery or scientific um, investigations. All of this, I think, are very legit um, purposes in scientific research that especially go beyond clinical practice. So to a certain degree, I think if we take this into consideration and we do not necessarily have to buy non-eliminative consequences. So I think we can make non-trivial generalizations about pain and different subtypes. And because of that, I think that we should not eliminate uh, pain from science altogether or references to pain from science altogether. But we should be careful about what context we use these things in and for what purpose. So to conclude the, my considerations and also say about which things we should be a bit more um, suspicious and also what kind of implications it might have for the broader debate. So in summary, it might turn out that oh, pain is a pretty weird family. They all don't necessarily look the same, so to say. Um, it's not a family of all same looking people. But I mean, that's that's just so to say what we have, I think, have to buy and given the recent state of the art. There's no ideal biomarker for pain, neither in the brain nor in the body. And maybe just every pain case and also all the different kinds of process that are involved just might turn out as idiosyncratic. I think that I'm quite radical in this in how far I would go with the idiosyncrasy. I know not everyone would be able to say even the entire other kind of processes given how the neural and the endocrine and the immunological system are linked also to genetic process and so on. Most of this, in my view, I would be happy to accept that all of this is to a certain kind of idiosyncratic. But this doesn't mean that we have that we are stuck with tokens. So even if this is true, all of this is unique. This doesn't mean that we cannot go beyond that. Um, and what I've tried to outline with the family resemblance theory is like a non-eliminative alternative providing 
a trade off, but that gives us an idea of how we can trade off between idiosyncrasy of pain and our scientific goals of generalizability. And what's relevant for that is, so to say, the strengths of similarities and whether they are similar enough um, for what we want to do with this, uh, with our generalizations. This might then depend on whether they are useful or not. Um, what this means for the general debate, I think first one implication is to accept that there's a multiplicity of scientific contexts in which neural data on pain are of relevance. Now, I think it's hard to say that one of them is more relevant than the other, even if we concept like I'm interested primarily in the clinical um, applications of these data. I fully agree with Corns is a very important thing, but just because generalizations about pain as such are not useful in this context doesn't mean that it doesn't, it's not useful in other contexts and how should we decide which of these contexts is from an objective perspective more relevant than the others. Further, I think that accepting idiosyncrasies does, as I said, does not exclude the possibility of useful generalization, but we should be aware of their limitations. So we should also not slip back into this oversimplified fiction, like say like, oh, pain, you have pain. Here is like, um, we are, we are up for finding like an easy solution for everything. Like pain might appear simple, but it's far away from being that. It's very complex and we have to do, um, to, to do justice to that. And as such, we should definitely not expect strict regularities, regularities or like this universal and exceptionist laws as we find them in physics. This is not what we're going to find. Most likely what uh, neural data can give us is probabilistic statements and best guesses based on similarities. So instead of focusing on a certain quest for certainty, also by saying like, oh, we sidestep this problems with the pain tokens and looking at types of neural mechanisms involved, we should just, so to say, accept that and try ways to handle uncertainty. And this is also in clinical context, for example, also in communication with patients. A few notes on treatment. So I think it's fair to say that treatment is one of the most central aims right now when it comes to pain research in general, because chronic pain in particular is such a challenging phenomenon for those affected and it has such a high prevalence. So it's also a challenge for uh, healthcare and society and economies um, that many people just focus on that. And I think, as I said, I think it's very, very interesting, but treatment is not the only goal of pain science or pain research. Especially that I think something that Colin Klein in his review of Jennifer Korn's book, uh, the complexity, uh, the complex reality of pain uh, has outlined. And I would also say that to a certain degree, it's an unrealistic demand from the beginning that our thera uh, therapeutic measures need to prove effective without exception and exclusively for those cases that we classify as pains or members of relevant subtypes. I think that in pain, it always seems like in everyday life, it seems like, oh, our pain, that is like this, the thing everyone, we know it. why don't we have this kind of, um, of easy solution for it, this universal cure for all pains. But I think if we think more about pain also in relation to other medical conditions, then it's clear that also for many other medical conditions, we don't have this kind of um, magic bullet, this kind of uh, medication or this one kind of intervention, which applies, so to say, to all instances of this medical condition, independent of the person, independent, so to say, how long they are suffering from it, independent of their life conditions. And especially, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to find a treatment that exclusively affects certain kinds um, of medical conditions, has, so to say, no side effects whatsoever, because in many cases, the biological processes that are involved in bringing about a certain medical condition are also involved in other kind of biological processes. So to a certain degree, I don't think that it's too surprising that we're not finding this with respect to pain when we start sort of thinking about pain more in relation to other kinds um, of medical conditions. But I still think it doesn't mean that we have to give up again. We can use similarities, for example, as guidance, and we, but we have to find out which are our most useful reference classes also for treatment. So what is what are the important factors that we need to take into account and also the combinations of factors and how they relate to each other that we need to take into account to select best treatment. And again, this should be based, of course, on evidences. So we should test for it. So we know, for example, that uh, whether people have more an anxiety an anxious style of coping with certain kinds, this can be a very important one factor, so to say, that plays a role in, in choosing which kind of treatments are better for certain individuals suffering, for example, from chronic pain. So I don't think that 
that this is the problem, but as a, we should definitely not expect a universal cure for pain, but we also don't need to make, so to say, entirely arbitrary decisions on how we treat patients suffering from pain. And finally, maybe also some notes on the brain. So, as you might have uh, recognized during the talk, when, P when neuroscientists talk about biomarkers, they do not necessarily talk about neurocorrelates. So biomarkers can be also things that are somehow involved in bringing about the uh, pain. So it might be that something is a very good indicator for whether a person is at risk of developing chronic pain, for example, then it could be in then it's often called like a useful pain marker for some aspects of pain, but it might not necessarily be considered the neurocorrelate of pain. So that's definitely a shift in the debate to a certain degree. Also, I would like to highlight that I'm really fascinated by neuroscience on pain, but I don't think that neuromarkers or biomarkers in general indicate the most useful targets for intervention. So in many cases, pharmacological, surgical, or electrophysiological interventions are not most useful. So often psychological and social interventions are more effective, less error prone, have less side effects. Also, biological processes are not necessarily the most useful factors to consider in clinical context in general. So even predictions, for example, about people are developing chronic pain. We might not need to look into the brain to figure out which are useful indicators for us to make these kind of predictions. This could also be psychological and social aspects. Um, and I think this is like a bit of work that I'm um, developing together with Peter Stilwell. Um, is to think about more about biological, psychological, and proce social process and how they interact with each other in, in bringing about chronic pain and how we might take combinations of these different factors as the most useful indicators, but also use most useful targets for um, therapeutic interventions. So to come to an end, I would also like to ha highlight two aspects that um, I'm thinking about and that wake me up at night. So if you have ideas on that, I was happy to have that. The first thing is to a certain degree, and both of them to have to agree with the starting point and Kripke. Kripke says pain is this thing with this unique immediate phenomenal quality, and this is how pain is typically understood. But if we really have a strong pain quality interpretation of that and say pain is the type of thing, and then we don't have a type of biological process, one might ask, doesn't this force us into dualism? I think it doesn't, and it really depends on how we understand the pain quality, but this is a bit of an ongoing work of mine, and to what does it actually mean that pains typically feel like pains to us? Well, I fully agree that subjective experience plays a really important role. I think this is an aspect that has to be better understood. The second thing also have to do a bit of the idea of what value our data on subjective experience of pain in science, in science in comparison to biological data I already indicated a bit that I think that subjective experience plays a very important role in better understanding chronic pain and that especially these kind of data can be very helpful um, to bring social and biological aspects together. I don't think their use is only to be translated into biological vocabulary. But I think it's fair to ask what use it is to classify pains as pains based on subjective experience. So why call them a family, for example? This is something that Rob Rupert is always pushing me on and saying, like, why you don't stop doing this altogether? Um, I think there's a use to it, to doing that. Um, but these are the kinds of questions where I, I still think that it would be interesting to work more on how our insights on neural data or biological processes relate to our insights on subjective experience, on phenomenal experience, and also on social processes um, involved in pain. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I have to thank a lot of people who also already helped me like writing um, this paper, and I'm much looking forward to your questions and comments. <laughs>